Hello, my name is Jonathan Clark, Halton Homes DJ Bolivia. Welcome to part three of my DJing for Beginners series. If you haven't watched the first two parts, I'll put a link on the screen right now. If you can't see it because YouTube doesn't put uh, annotations online for mobile, if you're watching on a mobile device, go to the text description under this video. That'll give you the link back. But for now, I guess I'll assume that you have now seen those first two sections and let's uh, get started. Okay, let's talk about programming and uh, the flow of your set for a while. So, first of all, think about anything that could interrupt you when you're DJing. And think about contingencies. Think about possible problems. Because early in the night, when you don't have anybody on the dance floor, if you can anticipate something that might go wrong, then maybe you can do something to kind of mitigate that, to make it uh, less of a problem if it does happen. So, for instance, and some of this stuff deals with safety too. Like for instance, if you're in a new venue, um, first time in a club, start thinking about what do I do if the fire alarm goes off? Do I have a mic available to talk to the crowd and to give them information? Um, should I go talk to the club manager and find out what their specific policies are on how to re react if the fire alarm goes off, if the lights go out, stuff like that? Um, do you have a flashlight? What if the lights go out? You know, make sure your flashlight is someplace where you know that you'll be able to find it in the pitch dark. Just little things like that. What if you, uh, you know, if, if you have to go for a bathroom break, um, let's say that you're playing a, um, in a club that's playing trance or something, and so you've got really long songs, nine, ten minutes long, maybe that's enough time for you to go for a bathroom break. But if you're doing a mainstream set, um, you know, where the songs are all three or four minutes long, that can make things pretty tough to get to the bathroom and back in time to mix into the next song. So a contingency that you can do is when you're home beforehand, pick three songs that you know you're not likely to need to use during the night, um, but they're good enough that you can get away with playing them. And mix the three of them together at home record it and turn it into a song that's 10 or 11 minutes long. And then that way, if all of a sudden at some point you get the urge to go to the bathroom and you need to make sure you've got enough time to get there and back, then put on this little three song mini mix, use that to give yourself a full 10 minutes to get to the bathroom and back. Because, you know, if, if you're in a busy club and there's a line up there and I guess as the DJ, you can kind of say, help, I'm the DJ, I need to get by quick before the song runs out. But even so. Um, also, if you're going to do a bathroom break or something like that where you have to leave the booth for a minute, make sure there's somebody nearby that you can trust to kind of stand guard of the equipment. Because I've seen places where a DJ has walked out of the booth and some random person from the crowd <laughs> goes in and starts talking on the mic starts hitting buttons, playing equipment, all sorts of stuff. So make sure you've got a contingency guard to assist you if you have to leave the booth. Um, let's talk about BPMs and energy levels. Okay, so BPM stands for beats per minute. And so basically it's the tempo, the speed of a song. And you measure it by just thinking about, you know, every time the kick drum hits, because if you're, if you're on a dance floor, you'll feel the beats. Boom, 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 boom. So you just start counting those. One, two, three, four, five. Count them for a full minute. That'll give you the beats per minute of the song. And with dance music, it's usually 98% of the time, it's going to be consistent through the entire song. Okay? And if you don't want to count for a full minute, you can get a pretty rough approximation by counting for 15 seconds and multiplying by four, or count for 20 seconds and multiply by three. Um, so the BPMs, when you, if you don't know your music that well, maybe it's a good idea to take a lot of the music that you're potentially going to play during a night and figure out the BPMs. And I've seen some DJs that will sort folders of music based on BPMs. Like they'll have everything that's between 60 and 70 beats per minute in one folder, everything between 71 and 80 in a second folder, or 80 and 89 in a folder, or something like that. Uh, 
so once you've got a good idea of the BPMs of your different tracks, or maybe you've got them all written down on a piece of paper, maybe you've memorized them, uh, then when you're mixing throughout the night, you can pick songs from a group where the BPM is approximately the same speed. Now, the reason this is good is because, in theory, as a DJ, your very best way to structure the energy levels through a night is to start low at 1 BPM, keep it, keep the energy level rising, and a faster tempo, a higher BPM, gives the listener the feeling of more energy. So you're playing stuff like maybe at 62, 64 BPMs, then you're moving up to 68, 70, 85, whatever, and you keep speeding up slowly through the night. So as the dance floor gets more and more packed later in the evening, the songs that are playing are faster and faster. Now, occasionally, depending on your crowd, depending on the situation, you may want to give them a break. And so let's say that we're not talking about an, a club that plays electronic music. So with trance, house, techno, all those things, you're not going to see such a huge range in tempo, you're going to see something like, like with trance, maybe the opening DJ starting at 130 and brings it up to about 133, then the second DJ goes from 133 to say 136, the headliner maybe goes from 136 to 142, 143, the last DJ, if it's, uh, if the event's ending relatively early in the night, maybe we'll keep it even going faster, or if it's a late night party where people are starting to get tired, they're playing till 7, 8 in the morning, maybe that last DJ is going to drop it down quite a bit and bring the energy levels back down. So there's not a huge amount of variety in a lot of electronic music genres throughout the course of a night. But if you're talking about playing at a wedding, any mobile DJ event, um, a club of mainstream stuff, then you may see tempos range from as low as 50, 60 beats per minute at the start of the night up to, say, 185 beats per minute within the space of an hour and a half, two hours, as you go through a whole bunch of different styles and get to really fast-paced alternative rock, stuff like that. And then, maybe, boom, it'll drop out for a few minutes, people calm down a little bit, and then pop dance music kicks in. And that's all, say, around 128 to 130 beats per minute. And so you got that boom, 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 boom. So the general theory is you should always be increasing BPMs throughout the night, gradually. If you have to decrease them, it feels better to decrease them really sharply a whole lot at once than to start ramping down slowly. Um, the only exception may be at the end of a night, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., for a uh, like for an all-night rave or something like that. Maybe the BPM count's going to come down gradually there as people are getting tired. But for the most part, mainstream music, classic rock, everything else, if you bring it down, bring it down fast. Okay? And if you have to, it doesn't mean it has to stay down. You might go for two or three hours, build it up to a climax, boom, play a slow song. Let everyone catch a breath, rest for a second, maybe go to the bar, get a drink, and then you start building it up a second time. Uh, yeah, that's the general theory about energy flows. Now, it's not just the tempo that affects the energy level. It's also um, what I call the intensity of the song, which you could better describe as the density of the rhythm section and of the synths. <coughs> if you have two songs, they're both going 128 beats per minute, and let's say one of them, for a while, features only a kick drum and a hi-hat, um, no, sorry, a kick drum going every beat and a snare going on the second and fourth beats. So you've got boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. Now, let's say there's a second song, same tempo, it's got the same kick pattern, same snare pattern, but on top, it also has a hi-hat that's going on every 16th note. So, instead of boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick, you've got boom, this will be my hi-hat, 
boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. Okay? The fact that there's faster drum beats, even though the tempo is the same, gives people the impression that it's a faster song, more energy. So, you can also, if you've got a whole bunch of tracks, say that I'm, I'm playing a tech house set, and say I've got a whole bunch of tracks that are 126 to 128 beats per minute, and I want to bring the energy level up, I may not do it by going 126, 126, 127, 127, 128. I may play them all around 127, or, or ramp up slowly, but I'll also pay attention to the order of the songs, and I'll put the less busy songs with lower density of drums and stuff earlier in the set, and once I get to the busy songs with lots of stuff happening, I'll put those more towards the end of the set. And if you want to hear an example of that, listen to pretty much any of my last hundred or so radio shows. Actually, any of my radio shows. But I think I've probably emphasized that a little bit more since episode 100. And you'll hear that the tempo from the start to the end of the mix doesn't change a whole lot. It might only change one beat beat per minute over the course of the entire hour, but the songs in the first half are far less energetic sounding than the busy tracks at the end of a set. Uh, there's different mixing styles. I've already touched on those. So you could have long drawn out mixes where you're beat mixing and the two songs are overlapping for a long time, or you can have very abrupt, quick things where you may still be matching tempos but the switchover is very quick. And depending on your genre, you can have just about, uh, you, you can have a huge variety. Like you look at a trance DJ or a progressive house DJ, they're the ones that go for very, very long overlapping mixes, if possible. Uh, with trance and progressive house, it's a little risky if you're not in the same key, because those long overlapping mixes can sound very, um, very bad harmonically, but if you're mixing in key, then you I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen DJs that often will make a mix last for four or five minutes, so that's pretty long. Um, and I've done it myself with some styles of music. Now, you get into something that's a little bit less well known for long mixes, like maybe techno, maybe house, and all of a sudden your mixes might only be, say, a minute, minute and a half, two minutes long. You get to another style, like um, hip-hop, and it may be that they're only overlapping, say, five, six, eight seconds as one song's going out and the new beat is coming in of the next one, um, because hip-hop maybe is a little bit tougher to keep mixed for long periods of time. There's more, of, there's more variation in hip-hop tracks in terms of different tempos, so you have, to, you have to be pretty on the ball and know your music really well with hip-hop. Um, and of course, then there's other stuff where, like drum and bass, dubstep, where you may have just the tempos matched the whole time, but when you're about to change over, boom, you do the quick flip over at the chop. Okay? So different mix styles depending on what you're uh, learning to mix. And, you know, you should learn to mix the same way that the rest of the DJs in that genre do if you want to sound consistent. You know, if you're a trance DJ, don't learn to mix quick chops, because that's not what dancers are used to. And if you're a hip-hop DJ or a drum and bass, don't try and draw your mixes out over two minutes. It just, it clashes. It doesn't feel right. Uh, <clears throat> possibly the most important thing that a new beginner DJ can ever learn, or certainly one of the top two or three things, is the importance of programming. When you're learning to DJ, especially if you're learning to beat mix, you are not going to be good at it for a while. It takes a while to learn. If you try to practice, say, two hours every night, it's going to take you a couple of weeks just to get to the point where you're comfortable doing very basic beat mixing um, mixes. So, what is more important for the audience is programming. And programming refers to your... Um, your picks of music, your song selection. And, you know, at the end of the night, when people look back on an evening, what do they remember? Do they remember the mixing? 
or do they remember specific songs that were played? Now, obviously, in some clubs, in some genres, there's a much higher expectation that the DJ will have good technical skills. You look at EDM, any electronic music, and there certainly is the expectation that people are going to be able to beat mix well. But if you're going into an event, and say you're, say you're playing at a wedding, you're learning to beat mix, and you're thinking, do I dare beat mix because I'm not good at it yet? Well, as long as you're picking good songs, that's what the crowd remembers the most. And basically, my rule is that 80% of DJing is good programming, and 20% is technical skills. Again, there's exceptions depending on the genre, but that's important to remember. So, if you're trying to beat mix, and it's not going that well, a particular mix, don't draw it out and bring more attention to it by having mismatched beats going for 15 seconds instead of 3 seconds. If it's not going well, cut it over. Switch to the new track, cut the old one out entirely, cut your losses. Just get out of there, get into the new track. And you know what? It may jog people's memory, or they may notice it, but they will forget in 6 seconds. Okay? If you draw that pain out for 15 or 20 seconds, it won't take them six seconds to forget. It might take them a minute or two. But the main thing is, even if you're doing a really quick mix during stuff that people would normally expect to be mixed out over a longer time, if you're playing good music, that's mostly what they'll remember. Okay? So I'm not saying that it's not important to practice, but it's not the end of the world if you screw up a mix. Just don't screw it up for a long time. More importantly, don't just think solely about your technical skills and play terrible music. Because if you play bad music, people aren't going to come on your dance floor in the first place. So it doesn't matter how technically gifted you are, if you're playing terrible music, people won't like you as a DJ. You will not get booked. You need to understand the role of an opening DJ, and of a headline DJ, and of a closing DJ. The opening DJ and the closing DJ are very similar. Um, the opening DJ, here's a big problem. I've seen a lot of beginner DJs play opening slots. That's where a younger, less experienced DJ will normally get placed because it's the opening slot <clears throat> and they will save the good DJs, the best DJs, for the headline slots when the dance floor is packed in the middle of the night, the peak hour of the night. And what happens is, I've seen so many opening DJs without a lot of experience go into it thinking, I've got to impress people, I've got to play the best songs out there, and I've got to whip that dance floor into a frenzy. And that is exactly what you don't do as an opening DJ. First of all, you don't want to whip the dance floor into a frenzy, because then they're going to be tired later in the night. And you have to go back to that theory of slowly building the energy up. Secondly, you don't want to play all the top hits early in the evening because one another rule of DJing, a track should never be played twice in one night. And that's a little awkward for a night when there's several DJs playing because it's possible for one DJ to not realize that he's played a track that an earlier DJ has played. So sometimes DJs will try to come out and listen to the DJ before them just to hear what tracks are being played to make sure that you don't play a repeat of the previous DJ's track in your own set. If you end up, as an opener, playing all the chart-topping hits of the, of the moment, all that's going to happen is your headliner is going to be so pissed off because you've played all these massive hits and then he or she feels like they shouldn't play them again because the dance floor has already heard them. You've wiped out some of the best hits that should really be played when the dance floor is packed, not 20 minutes after the dance floor has started. So, you know, I've seen beginning DJs screw up both those things, playing the big hits, playing way too fast and energetic in an opening set, 
And what happens? They don't get booked again because the headline DJ is pissed off, the promoter's unhappy. Yeah, it's a bad situation. So as much as it feels like when you're an opening DJ, you know, there might be a few people on your dance floor, they're kind of looking at you, and you feel like, oh no, they expect something more upbeat. Remember your role. You are the opening DJ. You're easing into the night. You're setting the scene for what's going to come later. And anyone who's important, the rest of the DJ staff, the event staff, they are going to understand what you're doing and you're going to look better as a DJ. Let the headliner do the massive hits and the high energy stuff. Okay? Closing DJs depends. Like if you have a it depends on the structure of the night. If I'm playing at an event where say the club closes at three in the morning and the DJs play from nine until three, which is six hours, and you've got three separate DJs, then it's probable that the headliner is going to play the last slot. So you'll have an opening DJ, a mid DJ who's bringing the energies up quite a bit more, and then the headliner is playing all the thrashing hits right up until the club closes at three o'clock. But if you're at an all-night event, let's say the music goes from 10 o'clock till eight in the morning, then Chances are the headliners may be playing from 2 till 4, maybe after, you know, if you're at a warehouse party, maybe 2 to 4 is a good time because it's after the clubs close, and so you get a, a bit of a rush at the event up until 2, then you get a flood of people just after 2 when the clubs have closed. Or maybe not that many people stay for the whole duration of the event, but a lot of people do come early in this particular area. So maybe in that case, the headliner slot is from midnight until 2.30, or midnight till 3. Maybe they get a three-hour set. And if that's the case, if the night goes on a lot past the headliner's slot, then usually the DJs at the end are trying to bring the energy level back down. People are tired, they've been dancing for hours, so slowly cut back the energy levels. And so you'll get, um, you know, if I... If I were to look at a typical typical event, then probably, the f and there's four DJs playing two hours each, the first one is going to be playing very slow, chill, laid-back house, deep house, something like that. Second DJ playing stuff that ramps the energy up, up a little bit more, maybe some, uh, some slightly bouncier house. Third DJ maybe is the peak part of the night. And that's where you've got your hard trance DJ, uh, a really aggressive host DJ, something like that. And then the fourth DJ may be playing, say, tech house, bringing the levels down a little bit, and playing a lot darker music, um, more weird, more introspective, more, um, more unique. Um, so the stuff earlier in the night not only was slow and the energy level slowly coming up, maybe it was more bouncy and stuff like that, but then after the climax of the night, when the headliner plays, then you start getting slowing down a little bit and playing that, that more uh, unique music that, uh, that I like. Anyway, uh, so if you're getting booked, understand very carefully what your role is. Are you an opening DJ? Are you um, ramping the energy up DJ? Are you a headliner? Are you a closing DJ? What's your position? And if you're the only DJ of the night, you have to think of your whole theory about slowly bringing up energy levels, slowly bringing up BPM counts, but you can also kind of put yourself in the shoes of, say, a couple different slots during the night. If you're playing for, say, six hours at a club, then maybe for two hours you're going to think, all right, I'm going to pretend I'm the opening DJ. I'm going to be playing deep house until 11 o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock you think, all right, I'm going to switch roles. I'm going to play the role of a host DJ, normal, upbeat, sort of bouncy host, and do that for two hours. And then from one till three, you may think, okay, this is where I'm going to put the pounding, pounding, hard house, um, hard trance, stuff like that. 
depends on the style of the club and everything. Um, as I said, try to never, ever, ever play a track twice in a night. That's really important. If you're in a venue where you have to deal with requests, I've already talked about that a little bit, but remember that taking a request at the wrong time of the night and playing it, well, it's good to keep the, the customer happy. Make sure you don't break up the flow of your set. So if you've been crafting this nice slow ramp up of deep house into tech house into normal house, and you get a request for a hard trance track, don't play that in the middle of your ramp up period. Just tell them, sorry, this just is not the right time for it. I will play it later. Don't let the requests ruin the flow of the evening that way. Um, learn to use an effective microphone. So, most people, when they first hear themselves talk through a microphone, are startled. Because the way that your voice sounds to the rest of the world is not the way that your voice sounds to you. Because when you are talking, what you hear is mostly filtered through your head, through the back of your throat, and so your voice sounds very different to yourself than when you hear it over a microphone, the way that others hear it. And a lot of people assume they have a fantastic voice, and then they, they hear it on speakers through a microphone, and they think, that's not my voice. Are you serious? That can't be my voice. That's not how I sound, is it? So it's a very, um, it's a bit of an epiphany for a lot of people when the first time they hear themselves on a microphone. So if you're not comfortable with the way your voice sounds, or if you haven't really ever used a microphone, get one and practice. Learn what happens when you hold microphones different ways. Some microphones are omnidirectional, and it doesn't really matter how you hold them, you're going to have the same sort of sound coming out of it. Other microphones are, they have certain different patterns, cardioid, hypercardioid, um, bi-directional, all sorts of stuff. And so if you hold a microphone one way, talk into it, and then twist it around and talk into it, you're going to get a different sound coming through. So be careful if you're not using an omnidirectional microphone. Also, you'll have to be careful of feedback. Feedback happens when loud noises from speakers in the club, not from your voice or anything like that, but from speakers, get loud enough that the mic hears them again, feeds them back through the stereo a second time, makes them louder, comes out the speaker, it's loud enough to go in the mic again, and it's kind of gets goes around in a loop out the speaker, in through the mic, out through the speaker, in through the mic, and it gets louder and louder, builds up. It's called a feedback loop. And that's that high-pitched whine that you hear. So, if you've got feedback coming from your dance floor speakers, you're in trouble, because you can't do a whole lot about the volume of those without turning them down for the entire dance floor, the entire club. In that case, your best bet is to take the speaker, take the microphone, and maybe cup it with your hand. So if all the sound is coming in from in front of you and you cup it, then that sound can't hit the mic as much. And you can talk into the mic like this, and it's mostly your voice that's going directly into it, rather than the outside sound that's causing the feedback. If you're in a DJ booth, that has a monitor or two monitors, you need to learn always, 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 when you pick up a microphone, the first thing you do is turn your booth monitors off because they're the thing that causes the feedback, okay? Or at least turn them down a whole lot so you can just barely hear it yourself. Another thing that you should practice is, um, I, I've seen people, because there's usually EQ controls on the microphone, and you may think you have a very tinny voice through a mic compared to what you're used to in your own head. And so to compensate, you may turn the treble, your, that, that DJ may turn the treble way down, turn the bass way up, trying to make their voice sound better. But turning the bass way up usually makes you sound muddier. And unfortunately, 
it's far most far more common for people to think they need to add bass to their voice, which means they're always turning the bass up, always making it muddy, when in fact your best bet is to not worry about the fact that your voice sounds tinny. People are used to it sounding tinny. That's what the world hears you as normally. And if you want to cut through the music, leave your mid-range on or maybe up just a tiny, tiny bit. Leave your treble on or up just a tiny bit and turn your bass down just a tiny bit. Works for more people than it doesn't work for. Okay. Um, a lot of mixers have a talk over button. And so when you're about to talk into the mic, what you're supposed to do is push the talk over button. It cuts the volume of the background noise by a significant level, like often 12 decibels or 18 decibels. And that way your voice comes through more clearly. The drawback with talk over buttons is usually they're pretty, um, the level of attenuation is pretty high. And so it really feels like everything has disappeared when you push talk and you're about to start speaking. So I find on a lot of mixers, rather than using the talk over button, I will use the microphone's volume button. And I will bring that up and I may, if possible, then let go of the volume button on the mic and I will play with the channel volume of the music going out and bring that down just a bit, just maybe six decibels instead of 12 or 18. Uh, it's also good because a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll crank the volume of the microphone up a whole lot and then they'll start talking and they won't realize they cranked it way too loud and you'll get this massive blast of the speaker's voice, usually distorted, coming through the speakers, startling everyone on the dance floor. It's, it's scary. So <laughs> instead of doing that, what I'll always do with the microphone, until unless I'm using it a lot in the night and I know exactly what level to be at, I will start off with the volume down and I'll be going check, 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 and then bringing the volume up. And as I'm bringing it up, I'm getting a sense of where it needs to be and I'll stop before it gets too loud. Okay, it's also good to do that. You might think, well, someone hearing check, 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 check on the dance floor is not that professional. But remember, they're not going to hear the first couple checks because you got the volume all the way down. They'll hear it once or twice, but if it's not a whole bunch of them, it's good because it catches their attention and makes them start listening to hear what's about to be said. So if you just start out of the blue with a quick announcement, they may not have been listening and they may know, not know as much about what you're talking about. That check, check, check is kind of like a, excuse me, pay attention. So that's good. Also, you'll hear a lot of people, um, when they're doing microphone tests, you'll hear one, two, check, check, one, two. And you'll kind of wonder, does this person not know how to count to three or four? Can't they do something to make it a little bit more interesting? Well, the reason one and two are often used repeatedly is because when you're speaking into a mic, one has more of a bass sound, one, whereas two, because it's got that t at the beginning of the syllable, it has more of a treble sound. So it's kind of a way to check both your bass and your treble levels in a small sense. Check, check, one, two. Okay? So practice with a microphone if you're not used to using it and don't blast it out too loud. You know, don't make people cringe and want to cover their ears when you're speaking, okay? You'll quickly get a sense because you'll be able to see the feedback. Like if you see people kind of drop their heads or cringing, then your voice may be a little bit too loud. But if you see them looking puzzled and moving their head around, it's because they're trying to reorient their ears to hear you better. That means that maybe you need to turn your music volume down just a tiny bit. Okay, being good at microphone use, it, it takes a little bit of practice if you're not used to it. And then finally, I already mentioned what happens if you need to go to the washroom. Well, find somebody that you trust in the club not to fiddle around with the music. Set something up, um, either like a little pre-programmed mini mix that you've made at home, like I suggested earlier, or depending on the venue, like if you're doing a wedding or something like that, my go-to song for some sort of situation like that is Rapper's Delight, the Sugar Hill game, because 
That gives you 15 minutes if you need to. It's the longest song that I can think of that people always love the Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight. And, you know, if you come back after seven or eight minutes and the dance floor is starting to get bored of it, because they will, even though they like the song, you know, more than six or seven minutes kind of gets a little bit repetitive, then you can just fade it out early and go into another track. But that's a nice, uh, that's a nice fallback emergency song. Okay. All right, let's get into beat mixing in a little bit more detail. Uh, not every one of you will use it, but many of you will. And it certainly makes a set, especially if you've got any sort of dance beat, certainly makes your set sound a lot more impressive. So it's kind of a key skill for a lot of DJs. Now, first of all, <clears throat> when you're looking at dance music, EDM, electronica, electronic music, whatever you call it, it's the kind of music that's got that 4-4 beat. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? And the 4-4 beat, it's music expression, which refers to four notes of one quarter note value per bar. So, when you're looking at music, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of theory, but the quick, dirty explanation is that when you hear dance music like that, with the boom, 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 every time you hear one of those hits, it's called a beat. Every group of four of them together is called a bar. And then sets of bars can be put together, and they're often known as a phrase. Okay, and usually a set of eight bars together makes up a phrase in dance music. Very occasionally, say, maybe 98% of songs have eight bar phrases, the whole song, when you're looking at dance music. But very occasionally, maybe 2% of the tracks out there, there may be a single phrase or two phrases inside the song that are different lengths than eight bars. Maybe you've got a seven bar phrase, maybe you've got a nine bar or a ten bar. Those seem to be common numbers. And or maybe also an extra one bar phrase or an extra two bar phrase. So when those happen, it kind of builds tension on the dance floor because although a lot of dancers may not intuitively know that they're dancing to eight bar, eight bar phrases, if they're used to electronic music, they've got a gut feeling that teaches them when the next major change in the music is gonna come around. And if you've been on a dance floor a lot, you kind of intuitive, intuitively know that. You just instinctively know when the music's going to do something. So basically, the way to double check this is to count beats. And I, I kind of, in some ways, hate teaching this to people, because once you've started counting beats, it's hard to ever stop, and it kind of sticks with you for the rest of your life. Now, the good thing is, Counting beats is not necessarily a totally bad thing, because it kind of keeps you intuitively in tune with where you are in the music. Anyway, think about four beats in a bar. So what I'm going to do is count one, two, three, four. But instead of keeping repeating that, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, every time a bar goes round, just doing an endless cycle of one, two, three, four, I want to also know where I am in the phrase. So the first number in each repetition, I'm going to increase it as I go through the phrase. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 3, 4, 6, 2, 3, 4, 7, 2, 3, 4, 8, 2, 3, 4, not 9. Usually, that's when a new phrase begins, and so you go back to one. One, two, three, four, two, two. Okay? You'd be surprised how common, how, how often this works in dance music. So, let's give it a shot with a remix, remix of one of my tracks. We're going to count out loud. You're going to hear the music in the background, and I'm going to count out loud. And listen to what the music does when I get to the end of each eight-bar phrase. And we'll do it about four times. 
One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, three, four, eight, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, two, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four, one, two. Okay, so you get the point. The phrase didn't change every time at the end of eight bars. Occasionally, it repeated another eight bars of the same thing, but when there was a change, a major change, it's almost always at the end of a set of eight bars when it restarts, okay? So that's how beat counting works. <coughs> now, when you're beat mixing, you have to worry about two things. First of all, you have to worry about the tempo of the new incoming track, and it's gotta be exactly the same as the tempo of the track that's already playing in order for them to be synchronized. Because if your old track is going 127 beats a minute and your new one is going 129, even if those beats line up for a second at the beginning, if the new one's faster, it's going to start getting ahead. And so instead of boom, 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 with them both synchronized, you're going to start hearing that sneakers in a dryer effect. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, um, second thing besides tempos matching, you have to have the downbeats matching. So every beat when it hits, boom, it has to hit on both of them at the same time. Boom, 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 not boom, 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 boom. Okay, so those are the two things that you have to worry about when you're beat mixing or beat matching. Now, it's better if you can worry about a third thing unless you're freezing. So once you get good at matching up individual beats within two tracks, you've done that for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, and all of a sudden it's clicking, you understand how to do it, and you can always make the match up. Then you want to start thinking about phrases. And so you always start the new song, because the first beat of the new song is almost always the first beat of a phrase. So you wait until a new phrase is coming around on your outgoing song before, boom, you start this one. So even if you've got it synchronized, ready to go, um, Okay, so let's uh, let's assume let's assume that we are close to okay so we've got the first beat of a phrase lined up right here in the middle of a song if this old track that's been playing is halfway through the phrase, we want to time letting go of this to match the phrasing of the old song. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let go of this at the beginning of a new phrase. So let's pretend this old one is partway through a track and we're at four, five, sorry, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four, go, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Okay, so phrasing is going to be important eventually, but when you're first starting out, you're going to work on just the basics.
just lining up the beats. Now, I have a couple videos that go into beat mixing in much more detail. Link right here, the bottom of the screen right now, which is the first of my two beat mixing videos, which talks about beat mixing on CD players. Okay, If you're trying to learn to beat mix on vinyl, you're not interested in CD players, you might want to watch the CD players one first anyway, because that's where I talk more about the theory. Now, <clears throat> if you want to watch a video where I beat mix an entire set, look for, do a Google search on SHG episode 150, or just SHG 150, 150, Q Perspective. And that one, instead of the version that the audience hears, that's the feed from the DJ's headphones. And so that way you'll be able to hear what I'm doing when I'm lining up beats. Now, I'm going to make it look probably a little bit easier than it really is, because I've done it for a while. And my mixing's not perfect there, but I didn't really intend it to be. Um, but it should be good enough that a new DJ will learn a lot by watching exactly how I mix and hearing exactly what I hear. So you can search SHG 150Q Perspective. Um, I've got a second one <clears throat> that's, that's on two, these two CD players with this mixer. I've got another set that's almost exactly the same way, different music of course, with these two CD players and a DJM 900 mixer. So for that one, search for SHG 156 Q Perspective. Now, if you're interested in um, DJing on vinyl, beat mixing on vinyl, here's the link to the vinyl version. Like I say, you should have watched the CD version first. And that's, this goes into the specifics of dealing with turntables and stuff like that too. So here's the beat mixing on vinyl video link. Also, I have one set online that is SHG160Q Perspective. Put that into a Google search, SHG160Q Perspective, and you'll be able to see the, the headphone mix set of when I did a, uh, one, one episode of my radio show on, on vinyl beat mixing. Now, <clears throat> I said that phrases are almost always eight bars long. Probably 97% of electronic music tracks that you get, like straightforward electronica, like trance, like tech house, um, probably 97% of those, all the phrases will be eight bars long. So it's a pretty consistent, easy rule to follow. Occasionally, maybe 3% of them, you'll get a phrase, one phrase in the middle of the song where it's only seven bars, or it's nine bars, or it's 10 bars, or there's some sort of short breakdown. So it's sort of like you have a baby one bar phrase in the middle or a two bar phrase in the middle. So don't be totally shocked if you get one of those occasionally. Um, pay attention to it and remember it because when you're playing live, you're gonna have to factor into account that halfway through your mix, halfway through your track, all of a sudden it's got an odd number of bars in the phrase. Um, you can also purposely mix up your phrase matching occasionally, once you get good, um, just for a little bit of diversity. Now, don't do it too often, <clears throat> because then your dancers are going to start thinking, wait, he doesn't know how to match phrases. Okay, so do it very sporadically, but used in uh, Used, used in moderation, used very occasionally, it can, it can kind of add to the set, bring a little bit of tension or a little bit of uh, diversity that the dancers, even though they may not realize it, it kind of heightens their dancing experience, I think. So if you are going to mix something where it's not quite on phrase, you've got three options that I find generally tend to work, some more often than others. Um, sometimes, when this phrase comes around, I will, or is about to come around, <clears throat> I will start this one bar early compared to where it should be. That is the least, um, least effective of the three. The only time I really do that 
is if this track is, is really fading out, it's coming down in volume, and I'm letting it come down in volume instead of keeping a constant volume, letting it fade away, and so the dancers think that there's going to be one more full bar before this thing kicks in. They're waiting for it, and they go, oh no, it's fading, it's fading, but the new one's coming. And then all of a sudden, boom, this one comes in at full volume, a bar earlier than they expected. So that's kind of cool. But uh, doesn't, I, don't, I don't do that very often. Um, more frequently, I will, when the phrase comes around, the beginning of the phrase comes around on your outgoing track, I will wait one extra full bar before I start this. That's my second most common. And third most common is when this, the, the beginning of a new phrase, is coming around on this one, I will start this one beat instead of a full bar, just one beat late. And so what happens, they don't notice this, <clears throat> because when you start it up, your volume's still going to be down on this, you're still working in your headphones. But over the next 15, 30 seconds, whatever, as you're slowly bringing it up, what's going to happen is the dancers who are intuitively counting this, even if they don't realize it, right when a phrase is about to end and they think they're about to get boom on the next beat, something new from this, what happens is there's a expectation that's not met for one beat and then a boom. So it's kind of like you're dancing all around, dancing along, you're going seven, two, three, four, eight, two, three, four, <gasps> boom. And you know, that, that punchiness, that's pretty cool sometimes. And I do that more often than the other two things. But most of the time, you're going to mix on phrase. Um, <clears throat> crossfader. Both these mixers have a crossfader. I do not use either one. Um, not all DJs use crossfaders. If you're a turntablist, you're scratching, you're almost definitely going to use the crossfader more than anything else. If you're... <clears throat> the basic... The basic theory is that with a crossfader, usually your two volumes are up all the time on the two channels you're mixing between. And by going from one side to the other with a crossfader, you're getting a constant mix. As one goes down, the other goes up, and no matter where you are, you have a constant volume throughout. <coughs> However, I usually disable the crossfader and I will do my fades on individual channels. So as one is coming in, the other is going out at the same time. And so I'm balancing my two channels this way. And you might think, if I'm trying to get a constant volume as the mix plays, why am I doing something where I have to move two controls simultaneously and be coordinated enough to keep them moving at the right speed when, instead, I could just use the crossfader and not have to think. The reason is because <clears throat> with the crossfader, there is no option to be at anything other than that perfect cross. If you're playing with channel volumes, you have some flexibility. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say that this is the track that is fading out. Okay, so I'm going to fade out like that. This is the track that's coming in, so I'm going to fade in. With the crossfader, or by doing a constant fade on the two channels, normally you're going to see the balance shift equally. Okay, But if this track that's coming out is especially quiet, what if I want to be able to keep the volume up on this one a little bit longer than usual because of the fact that it's quiet to give me a better volume. So I can start fading this one in before I start fading that one out. Okay, so I have a lot more flexibility when I'm working with individual channel um, sliders. So some DJs, some DJs use the channel sliders only, some use the crossfader only, and some do a weird combination of both. So whatever you're comfortable with, that's, what, uh, that's what's going to work for you. Just do what you're comfortable with. When you're learning to mix, if you get frustrated 
and things aren't coming together, just walk away. Walk away for a few minutes. Walk away for 10 minutes, half an hour, okay? It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be beat mixing and doing it well. Um, if you're starting from scratch and you spend a couple hours a night, it's going to take you a couple weeks just to start getting comfortable doing very basic matches. And it may take you a month before of, of practicing every single day for a couple hours before you get to the point where all of a sudden you're thinking, hey, I'm doing this well. I'm starting to make my beat matches and I'm doing it on the proper phrasing. Okay, so don't have expectations that you're the exception to the rule and magically it's all going to come together and you're going to learn how to do it in three or four hours over a couple nights. It's not that easy, okay? You have to put in the time to practice and just don't get discouraged. You will get frustrated. There'll be times when you, if you're, you want to pick up a record and fling it at the wall or, you know, you'll just want to, who knows. Anyway, expect that. When that happens, take a break. Don't go have a shot of tequila because that's going to throw off your coordination, make things even worse when you come back. Just go take a break away from the decks, take a glass of water. It's all going to be good. Give it time. Give it a break. Come back and give it a shot again. And if it's still not working, take the rest of the night off. Try again tomorrow when you're in a different mood. Now, you may have heard about mixing in key. <clears throat> if you are trying to mix in key as a beginner, you're maybe jumping the gun because mixing in key is a little bit more challenging and you want to be able to get the basics down first. You want to be able to beat mix constantly, perfectly, before you start really thinking carefully about mixing in key. So what does mixing in key mean? Well, on a piano keyboard, <clears throat> there's 12 different notes in each octave. And when an octave repeats, those 12 notes in the next octave are going to sound like the ones in the first octave, although they'll be double the pitch. Okay, but they'll sound the same. So a low C compared to a high C, they're going to sound, not when I sing, but <laughs> they're going to sound compatible. Okay, music is written in different keys. And the different keys that the music's written in is based on the notes on that piano keyboard. So basically the starting note of a song, that's a simplification, but if you start on the root, which is common, the starting chord of a song is going to be the key that it's in. And to complicate things a little more, there's both minor and major keys. So there's really 24 different standard keys. Actually it gets far more complicated than that because there's all kinds of, mon of uh, yeah, so much music theory that I'm not going to try and teach. There's lots of different types of minors. Uh, basically, if you don't know music theory, don't even think about this stuff yet. The simplest thing, if you don't know music theory, <clears throat> is that most long electronic music tracks don't have any pitched instruments in the beginning or end of a song. So the first 16 bars of a song might have no synthesizers, no <clears throat> obvious bass. It may be just drums, which are, you know, technically drums are pitched, but they don't really feel pitched. And so if you are mixing from one song that's in one key, like say it's a, say it's a uh, D major key, and the next song coming in is a, it's an A flat major, and those two keys do not work well together, then instead of worrying about the fact that they're not going to sound good together when the music is both playing at the same time, you only mix the end little bit of pure drums from this track with the beginning pure drums of this track, and the drums will work well together, and you don't have to worry about, that, uh, about the key signatures not working very well together. Okay, so that's what a lot of DJs do, is just, you know, don't go for those long three, four minute mixes. Now, if you do happen to know some music theory right now, 
then I'm just going to give you a 30 second explanation that will clarify a little bit about mixing in key. If you're mixing in key, there are basically six of the 24 key signatures that will work for you in your next track. Okay? <clears throat> Going from one track to another, and I will pretend that the original track is in C major because that's the easiest for most of us to think about. The best choice to go into for key mixing is another track that is also in C major. Your second best option is a key that is in the perfect fourth, the perfect fifth, or the relative minor. So for C major, if your next track is in F major, or G major, or A minor, those all work great too. Your third choice, which usually works fairly well, not quite as perfect, is you go into the minors, which are one and two whole tones up from your root. So for a C major, if this tune is a D minor or an E minor, it works decently too. Okay, so top choice from a C major is C major. Next best choice is either F major, G major, or A minor. Third best choice, D minor or E minor. Any other key or being in the wrong mode, or, uh, major instead of minor, minor instead of major, probably not going to sound great. Okay, and to do the same thing, if you happen to be starting in a minor key, your top choice is going to be the same minor key. Your second choice is going to be the perfect fourth minor, the perfect fifth minor, or the relative major. So let's say that we're starting in A minor, then your best choices, your second best tier of choices would be D minor, E minor, C major. And your third best choices would be the majors, which are one whole and two whole tone down from your minor. So if this was A minor, your third best choices would be G major, F major. Okay? If you didn't understand any of that because you don't know music theory, don't worry about it. A lot of DJs don't mix in key. That's something to, to work on once you know a lot of theory and once you've been DJing for a while. Okay? That's about all for beat mixing for now. Go back and watch those other two uh, videos that I did and maybe some of my sample mixes if you want to learn a lot more. It takes a while to learn. Now, I wanted to do a section where I talked about a bunch of the different uh, DJ software packages that are available out there. Now, the thing is, most of this overall DJing video is going to be useful for several years. But the section about laptop DJ software is going to, you know, that's an evolving area. This is stuff that changes very quickly from year to year. And so rather than include a section on DJing software as part of this main video, I'm going to put a link here right now to a separate video where I talk about some of the different packages because that way I can update this video over and over again year after year so it's always a little bit more current and more useful to you. Um, there's all kinds of packages out there. There's Virtual DJ, there's Serato Scratch, there's Tractor, there's Decadence, there's Atomics MP3, um, there's Tractor, did I say Tractor? There's DSS DJ, there's PC DJ, DEX, um, there's apps on tablets, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm not really going to mention Ableton because that's a little bit different than the rest of these packages. I'll talk about Ableton later. Anyway, you've got the link here, so if you do want to learn about different um, software packages, go watch that video. Um, basically, at some point, eventually, I'm going to start reviewing all the different software packages. But in this video, I'll just do a very brief overview of some of the main differences between the different packages, and I'll talk a little bit about things like um, what to look for in a PC, how to build a system for laptop DJing, um, you know, how much, what the differences are between memory and hard drive space, um, 
different types of hard drives, the bandwidth, how they how they communicate, um, you know, SSDs versus HDD, stuff like that. Okay, so check out that video if you're interested in using DJ software to DJ, and at least I'll keep that fresh and uh, update that every year or so in the future. Okay, in this section, let's talk a little bit about some software called Live by a company called Ableton. And so Ableton's Live software, a lot of people just refer to it as Ableton because really it's, it's their main product, it's their flagship product. And what Ableton is, it's, it's basically a DAW, which is a type of software, it refers, it's short for desktop audio workstation. And basically it's audio editing software. And so in, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to other software that you may have heard of, um, software like um, Cubase, like Logic, like Audition, like Pro Tools, like Sonar, stuff like that. Okay. So, but the thing is about Ableton is when they designed it, they made it uh, a little bit different than all the other DAWs and, uh, and sequencer stuff out there. Um, so basically, it's, it can be used to DJ. Now, it's very distinct from all the DJ software, like Virtual DJ, Serato, Scratch, Tractor, stuff like that. Okay, so it's sort of not a group of the DJ software packages. It's off on its own, but it can DJ. And it's sort of a branch of the DAW group, although it's a little bit off on its own because it was uh, such a front runner in incorporating things that uh, that allowed for like real time live looping and 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 pitch uh, sorry tempo tempo adjustments uh, through through a process called warping <coughs> that allowed music to conform to global tempos and stuff like that and and there's certainly other DAWs that incorporate some of this stuff like warping now. But Ableton did it first and, and did it best. So, how do I describe this a little bit better? Basically, with Ableton, if you want to use it for DJing, um, there's two things you can do. You can import all your songs as a clip. You just drag and drop them into, your, into what's called session view. And you can press play on them one after another, and they'll just play through the program. And if you don't have those songs warped, they will play back at the original speed as a, as a normal song. And so if you want to DJ in a radio style, like say you're playing a whole bunch of classic rock tracks like that, all you do is you don't warp those songs, you just play them as is, one after another, and they play. So in that sense, it's fairly similar to something like Virtual DJ. However, if you're playing dance music, or, or anything else, although it seems to be most suitable, most appropriate for electronic-based music that has regular sequential beats, um, if you've got music like that, trance, house, drum and bass, and any of those genres, then what you can do is, you can do a process called adding warp markers, and you can, the program will do it for you automatically, although I find it works a little bit better if you go in and do it yourself. And it doesn't take very long. Most songs for me take maybe 45 seconds to add these warp markers. But once you've done that, the song always conforms to the global tempo of the session. And it stays on beat. So if I've got three songs that are all warped, as one of them is finishing up, I can press play on a second warped song. And even if the two songs started out as different tempos, both of them will be playing back at the global tempo, which means at the same speed. And when the second one starts, it'll automatically be quantized, synchronized up to the same beat, so that the beats are matched up. And you can play from song to song. I can play all three songs in order. I can play as many as I want. And the tempo, everything will be beat matched. So that's pretty handy if you're an electronica-based DJ. It makes beat mixing very simple. 
And does that cheat take away from your performance as a DJ? Well, some people would argue yes, and in some ways I would argue the same thing. But you can also think on the other hand is if you're not focusing so much on the beat mixing, because you can't screw that up really, it gives you a lot more time to focus on other stuff while you're playing, which means focusing on programming, focusing on bringing in different effects, doing looping and stuff like that, which can kind of take your performance to a whole new level. So is it worth it to not do the beat mixing? Does that make you less of a DJ? Maybe in a purest sense, but at the same time, if it improves your performance and makes what comes out of your mixer sound a lot better, a lot more unique, a lot more developed and professional, then maybe it's worth it. A lot of people think so anyway. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with that because you know, a lot of people on your dance floor may not be watching you. Maybe they're in the back corner. All they can hear is what's coming over the speakers. And so to them, the final product is what's important, not the way that you're, you know, adjusting pitch controls and stuff like that. So, so Ableton's pretty fancy that way. And within Ableton, there's two different ways of doing it. You can have all your mixing being done within the software, and then just a single stereo master output comes out and goes to your speakers. And in that case, you know, there's a little bit less DJing there. It's a little bit more computer work. But you can also have it set up, if you've got the right sound cards and everything, so that your different tracks are coming out to your mixer on different channels, in which case you're maybe pressing play on the laptop on the new song, but you're mixing volumes, you're mixing effects, and all sorts of stuff on a DJ mixer, like a traditional DJ, which brings it a lot closer to the, the perceived traditional style of DJing and, and maybe makes it a little bit more acceptable, but certainly makes a lot more fun and also gives you a lot more power because you've got all the functions on a mixer in addition to whatever's in the software. So you can really do some creative stuff if you do it that way. So um, if you're curious to learn more about this, yeah, I'll give you some examples so you can check this out in a minute. One thing I should point out before I do that, though, is because Ableton Live is sort of originally designed for software, for music production, for authoring, um, and even recording, like live vocals and stuff like that, you can record in just like you could into Pro Tools or something like that. But because it's designed for live production, or for studio production, either one, um, it's very flexible in that it can take elements of a mix that you've been working on and you can drag and drop parts of that into your DJ set. And the neat thing is you can play them in any order. You can repeat them, you can layer them over other complete songs or other loops or partial songs or whatever. And so what this means is that somebody who, who knows what they're doing in Ableton, when they make a DJ set, when they're performing live, they're not just playing one person's you know, one, one previously produced track after another. They're not just playing someone else's music. They can be playing their own stuff, but not even stuff that they've released to the public. They can be remixing this stuff live, coming up with a completely different arrangement on the fly than anyone's ever heard before, including themselves. And so this kind of a performance for a dance crowd, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. So it can, it can produce sets that nobody in the world has ever heard before. So Ableton's got a lot of power that way. Now, I have a couple things online. If you're curious to check them out, um, if you're just curious to watch a single set with Ableton and kind of see what it can do, I've got a video. You can do a Google search and look for episode 155 SHG audience perspective. And so there's a YouTube video, and it's about an hour long, and it's one of my radio shows, and I just have the cameras recording what's going on as I'm playing the show. So you can see me, you can see that I'm doing a little bit of stuff with the computer, starting and stopping songs, but you can also see that I'm doing much more work with the mixer like a traditional DJ would. And if you liked that, that, that video, um, the audio in it, plays what the audience would hear. It's got a companion video to it, and you can find the links in, in that video. 
that show the same video but with the audio being the DJ's cueing perspective. So if you're trying to learn to DJ, you can hear what I'm hearing in the headphones instead of what the audience is hearing out there. And I think you could really learn a lot from that if you're a DJ that's just learning more about the actual performance parts of it. So check that out. Um, SHG 155 Audience Perspective in Google. Or if you go to my radio show website, which is chma.fm, if you go to that, scroll down the page a little bit, and you'll see four different, or at the moment four, maybe more soon, um, you'll see a couple different episodes of my show that were all filmed on video, and number 155 is the one that's produced using Ableton and using a Zone 4D mixer from Allen and Heath. And I think you'll really open your eyes to some of the possibilities of, of that particular piece of software. Now, Ableton, this is sort of how I really got into this whole YouTube thing, is because I made, I had some people asking me how to use Ableton, and I thought, well, the easiest way to show them is to put together a video. I had a week off out, out west. And uh, so I put together three videos, one of them called Warping Tracks in Ableton, one of them called Putting Together a Studio Mix using Ableton. So that'd be, that'd be for like a radio show or something like that. That's not the real-time live performance. And then I had another one called Mastering and Mixing, Mixing and Mastering, your CD mix. And so those three videos, some of them have more than a quarter million views. It's amazing how, how popular they've been. So Ableton can be used in that respect for studio production work when you're putting together something to be played later over the radio or something like that. Because that was so popular, and some people asked, well, can you give me more background sort of on how it's used if you're performing live in front of a crowd? So I did a second series um, of five videos that teach the whole process of learning to DJ in real time for a crowd with Ableton. And the last video in that series is basically sort of the, the run-up in the production of that radio show that I mentioned earlier. But the first four videos take you from the very beginning to, to reasonably um, professional Ableton setup using, you know, maybe using MIDI controllers, teaching you hopefully everything. And they've been very popular too. So I put a link a few minutes ago to the first of the three... Uh, uh, sorry, to a blog post of um, that shows links to all the videos in the Studio DJ Mix production series. And right now, here's a link to a blog post which has all the, um, all the stages in performing live with Ableton. So check it out. This may not be the way that you want to DJ ever. You may want to play on regular equipment, or you may want to use more traditional DJing software, like the AB back and forth type of software. But either way, even if you don't want to use Ableton, you should watch some of these videos so at least you understand the capabilities. Because, you know, it's a tool that, that a lot of DJs completely ignore because they don't understand what it does or how they could use it. And then years later, they finally watch one of these videos or they see someone using it and they're just blown away and think oh why didn't I learn to use this stuff earlier okay it's a nice option you may not want to use it but you might be quite interested in learning it